Hi, real quick before we get into the video, I wanted to let you know two things. First of all, shameless self promo, I am hosting a live screening of Catching Fire, the most iconic Hunger Games movie of all time in Toronto this April. If you wanna come, there are shadow on games like Rocky Horror, drinking games, signature cocktail, all that fun stuff. All the information for that is in the description below. Also, I have a podcast, it's called Girl History, where we unpack different historical events. This season is all about the Salem witch trials. We just did an episode all about the Crucible. The season before was all about the Titanic. It's fun, fun stuff. All the information for that will be in the description below. Thank you so much for letting me shamelessly self-promo. Let's get into the video. Hi, hello, how are you? Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Carly and um, I talk shit. That's it, that's the end of the story. Thank you so much for watching, bye. A while ago, I made a video about Divergent and I called it Divergent is literally the worst movie I've ever seen. Is it the worst movie I've actually ever seen? No, but I love clickbait and I love hyperbole and I won't apologize for being the queen of hyperbole. Okay, it is my birthright. But it got me thinking about all the other kind of teen dystopian movies that are bad. And you know, turfs aside, a lot of teen kind of fantasy and dystopian movies are, are quite good. I think that they're really interesting and I think that like speculative fiction is a great way to like introduce the idea of critical thought to children. No arguments there. A, a hot take coming in at one minute into the video, I know, but okay. There is one, <laughs> there is one movie that I remember being quite bad and has been in the zeitgeist recently because it's been rebooted to a TV show. And that is of course, Percy Jackson. I read the first and maybe the second Percy Jackson book when I was like 10. I liked them. I wasn't a fan fan, but I, I did really enjoy them a lot. And I remember watching the movie in theaters and being like, this is bad. So I rewatched it and I was like, oh, this is really bad. Like the Divergent movies barely make sense, but there's a certain je ne sais quoi about them that makes them interesting. You know, Theo James is acting. Shailene Woodley is is acting. There's some there's something there that I can't explain, but it, it they were interesting. To watch Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief is to know a movie with no stakes that's incredibly boring. It's crazy how boring a movie that's basically about teenagers and Greek mythology can be because the actual like ideas behind this are fun. When I was watching this movie, I was like, that's a fun idea. Why does it suck? So I'm going to break down and recap the Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief movie. A quick disclaimer. Well, first of all, I'm gonna misspeak. I feel like that's a blanket statement for every single one of my videos. Um, I'm not a detail oriented person and I will misspeak and that's just part of it. That's just kind of part of the fun, quirky vibe that is this channel and that's why you love it. Another thing is when you're thinking about movies, crazy way to start that sentence, a lot of people have to work on them and it's crazy, like the budget is insane. If there's like a flock of geese flying in a b-roll shot, there's a guy who's the geese guy and his job is geese on the movie and he's so stressed about the geese. Like every single person is working so hard on their specific thing. So when I make fun of this movie, I'm not making fun of them. I think realistically when a movie like this gets bad, it's because of execs that are adding too many cooks in the kitchen, so to speak. So the acting and you know, the writing and all these different things. All this is to say, I'm not dunking on any specific person. Logan Lerman is like a good actor. Like he, I he, he, I do get him confused with Dylan O'Brien. <laughs> I get Carrie Mulligan and Michelle Williams confused, like truly gun to my head. I could not tell you which one's which. And I will, I can't tell them apart. And Dylan O'Brien and Logan Lerman, I also get confused. Also Dylan Minnette from 13 Reasons Why, like they all kind of blur together for me, but this is Logan Lerman. And in Perks Being Wallflower, he's a fully good actress. The girl who plays Anna Beth um, is in White Lotus and she's great in that. The guy who plays Grover has like really funny line delivery in this movie, like the acting is good. I'm sure that everyone working on this movie was doing their best. So that's just to say it's nobody's fault. God, this movie is boring. Hi, I just wanted to take a quick break and thank Scentbird for sponsoring this video. You might not be able to tell because you can't smell me through YouTube yet. Scientists are working on it, but I am genuinely obsessed 
with fragrances. The compliment of being like, you smell so good, is my favorite compliment to receive, which is why I am so excited to be working with Scentbird. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service that allows you to try out a new designer fragrance every month for just $17. They have a wide variety of fragrances. They have perfumes and cologne, as well as unisex scents. Even though you only pay $17, a lot of their fragrances are valued over $100 and $150, some even up to $300. Okay, so this is from Room 1015, and this is Purple Mantra. And I got it because it's like inspired by the Beatles trip to Marrakesh in the 60s. That's just the kind of stuff I love, but it smells kind of like, um, like lavendery with, I want to say sage, and kind of floral with a bit of like incense. Love. I really like woody scents. This is so good. Okay, this is Nothing But Sea and Sky by Unui Nomad. It's called Nothing But Sea and Sky because it's inspired by Montauk Point, which Walt Whitman wrote about in Leaves of Grass. This has got some like bergamot and sandalwood. It's very like fresh. It is very beachy. Got a little bit of a musk. I love that. This is Stag by The Maker. This is very woody. It smells kind of like patchouli. It's got a bit of grapefruit. This is Skin Bouquet by Mallow. It's got jasmine and pear. Hair. It's still a little bit of wood. I love a woody scent. If you're trying to find your new personal scent, it can be really hard to commit to a full-sized bottle of perfume, but with Scentbird, you get a 30-day supply of each scent. So you can try out new fragrances before you get a whole bottle, which is awesome. So if you want to smell nice all the time, like me, go to the link in my description below and use the code UNCARLY55 to get 55% off your first month at Scentbird. If you do the math, women in STEM, that's only $8. Again, go to the link in my description below or scan the QR code on the screen now and use the code UNCARLY55 to get 55% off your first month of Scentbird. Thank you so much to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Let's get back into it. So let's get started, okay? So this movie starts with Zeus and Poseidon meeting. And one thing you need to know about this movie is that everyone talks in the most expositional way physically imaginable. This literally starts with Zeus being like, Poseidon, it's me, Zeus. I know you stole my lightning bolt. And then Poseidon is like, it's me, brother, Poseidon, and you are Zeus. I didn't steal your lightning bolt because it is forbidden for us to steal each other's powers. That's how, you know, how people speak. That's just how people speak. That's how dialogue sounds, right? So basically, we're setting up the stakes for the entire movie. Zeus's lightning bolt is stolen. He thinks that one of the gods or their sons has stolen it. Specifically, he thinks Percy has stolen it, who is the son of Poseidon. And if he doesn't get his lightning bolt back before the summer solstice, spring solstice? The solstice. There's going to be a war between the gods that will end the planet. Which is crazy to think about because the stakes in this movie have never been lower. But in actuality, if Percy doesn't get this lightning bolt to Zeus, the world will end. Again, hate to bring up Harry Potter, right? Hate to give JK Rowling the satisfaction. But when Voldemort talks, you're like, this is an evil guy and bad things are gonna happen. When the gods hear talk, you're just like, mm, it's... Seems like a community theater production of a Greek tragedy. They're just like, brother, the world will end. You ju I just don't care, okay? Now we cut to Percy. Percy is underwater, holding his breath because he's the son of the Poseidon, because he's son of Poseidon, you know what I mean? Like he's just holding his breath because he's son of Poseidon, do you understand? He loves water and he holds his breath for truly maybe three minutes in real time while they do the credits. A crazy choice. It's not, it's not interesting to watch someone hold their breath in a movie, I'm sorry. He jumps out of the water. He's at school with his best friend, Grover. Grover's like, whoa, man, how do you do that? How do you hold your breath for so long? And he goes, I love water. It's the only place I can think, which is not an answer to the question <laughs> at all. Just not an answer. He goes to school. Basically, he goes to a special school. Um, I believe it's for students, either troubled students or students with disability. Grover uses crutches and he has dyslexia and ADHD. Okay, that's gonna come back later because it's gonna he relate heavily to Greek mythology. So strap in for that. He comes home and talks to his mom in their little apartment. And his mom is like, how was school? And he's like, I hate it there. My dyslexia, it's getting worse. It's getting worse. And she goes, well, how do you, how do you know? And he's, he goes, it's, it's the ADHD of it all. Like he, again, we love exposition, obsessed with it. Then Percy's mother's boyfriend comes in and I want to say he's played by Harvey Keitel. Should I look it up if he's played by Harvey Keitel? I think it is. 
No, okay, so see, I just saw a picture of Harvey Keitel and that's truly not the actor I was thinking of. Who am I thinking of? We may never know. Who is he played by? Okay, Joe Pantoliano. Just a different, just a full different actor. Okay, not played by Harvey Keitel. Sorry about that. He's just kind of like a shitty boyfriend. He comes in and Nuance has no place in this movie and he goes, woman, where's my beer? She goes, you can get it yourself. And he's like, I've had a hard day at work. Woman, get me my beer. She goes to get him his beer and he slaps her on the ass. Percy's like, hey man, that's my mom. Have some respect. And he's like, shut the f up. So he's just evil. He sucks ass. He's awful. Okay. Next day at special school for, for kids, <laughs> they're at the museum. He has a, um, a teacher named Mr. Brunner, who is a man in a wheelchair. And there's also a substitute teacher who's just kind of like really staring Percy down in a weird way. They're at the museum and they're in the Greek mythology section. And Percy knows a lot about Greek mythology. He knows what a demigod is, which is half mortal, half god, if you didn't know. Okay. And also he was saying that one of the demigods is named Perseus. He can read ancient Greek. The way that his brain with its dyslexia switches around the letters in English, switches around the letters correctly in ancient Greek so he can read ancient Greek. He's honestly slaying at the museum. And then the, the substitute teacher's like, hey, can we talk in this room that's sequestered from everybody else? And Percy's like, okay. Which is how abuse happens, <laughs> kids. That's how abuse happens. If the substitute teacher that's been there for one day is like, hey, can we talk in this sequestered Westward locked room? No. She then turns into a beast, okay? She turns into this like horrific flying bat thing. There's a name for it. It's a fury. And it's like, she's going like, where is the bolt? Give me the bolt. And she grabs him, truly flies him to the ceiling. It's like a two-story room. Then Mr. Brunner and Grover come in and they're like, get out of here. And they chase her away. She drops Percy from truly a two-story fall. It has to be at least 20 feet. He falls, he's fine. And they realize now that the underground kind of Greek mythology world knows where Percy is and they've been trying to hide him. So he's not safe here anymore and they need to take him to Camp Half-Blood. They're freaking out. Percy's like, what's going on? Grover's like, we need to go. But before he leaves, the teacher is like, wait, take this. It's a powerful weapon, use it sparingly. And it's a little pen that when you click the top, it turns into a sword. Really cool for like a tween teen children's book. In reality, if your te- imagine your teacher gave you a sword. Your teacher's like, here, take this Glock just to be safe. That's insane. So they go home to tell Percy's mom he needs to pack and he needs to get his ass out of New York City. The Big Apple. The city's so nice, they named it twice. And Harvey Keitel, who's not Harvey Keitel, and his buds are playing poker. And he goes, can't you see that she's serving us beers? Because bad men like beer, okay? Good men are Greek mythology figures. Bad men love beer. And they're gonna leave and they're like no we need to get out of here stop being mean to my mom harvey keitel who's not harvey keitel hins percy up against the wall and is like shut the up so he's a bad guy i mean you hate to be the character that threatens a child 30 minutes into the movie it's not ideal but alas that is the cards this character has been dealt rover uses his crutches to absolutely destroy harvey keitel who's not harvey keitel just beats him up and is doing parkour, beats up in front of his entire poker game. They grab Percy's bag, they run, they're driving because they got to get to Camp Half-Blood, bitch, okay? While they're driving to Camp Half-Blood, this is when Percy's mother explains her relationship with Poseidon to Percy and why Percy's father is not in the picture. It's a, actually like a, an important scene. I wish they focused way more on the impact on these child's lives that having absent parents has on them because I think that's actually very, very interesting. They've also aged the characters up in this movie. If I recall, I think they're supposed to be like 12 in the books and I think in the series and they're 16 in the movie. So like to be a 16 year old boy is to no rage. You know what I mean? To be a 16 year old period is to understand unbridled rage in a way that nobody else ever will or has before. It's focused on a little bit, but I want more of it. And this scene is genuinely like, pretty good and she's basically saying that she and Poseidon fell in love he genuinely loved Percy but he's literally not allowed to be in Percy's life because he's a god seems like a convenient theory but okay <laughs> but when this scene is happening she's driving his mom um and she's looking at him to tell him this story because that's acting and eye contact and be the camera being able to see your eyes 
is good. And that's why this scene is good. But she's also absolutely ripping it down the George Washington Bridge. Like she seems to be driving 90 kilometers per hour, if not more, on the George Washington Bridge, just not looking at the road and being like, yeah, so I'm with Poseidon. And it's like, wah, wah, wah. like, it seems like she's truly eyes off the road, whipping it down a bridge, which is amazing. They're driving at night now. I think Camp Half-Blood is in upstate New York. It's, that's the vibe I'm getting, okay? Could be in New Jersey, who's to say? Comme ci, comme ça, c'est la vie, as the French would say. While they're driving, a cow gets thrown onto the road and on and the car fl flips and flips and they're in a car accident because there's a minotaur, a massive beast that's now going after Percy, okay? So they're in a massive car accident. Grover then turns into a satyr, which is half human, half goat. So he uses his goat legs to kick the car window out so they can escape. And he chooses that moment to go, is it just me or is it raining cows? Not now, Grover. We're being attacked by a beast. We don't need a little quip. They're running from this Minotaur who's booking it after them and they get to Camp Half-Blood. But Percy's mom can't enter Camp Half-Blood because she's not a Half-Blood and she's not a god, she's a mortal. So then she disappears. You think she's dead, okay? So let's just assume for the sake of the story right now she's dead. And Percy uses the Minotaur's horn, which got stuck in a tree, to kill it and then faints, okay? He wakes up three days later he's been unconscious for three days so let's check him for a concussion please he's in like an old-timey infirmary where people are drinking from just like clay pots get him to the er he has a brain bleed and grover introduces him to camp half-blood camp half-blood is a secret summer training camp thing sequestered in the woods where the children of gods stay to train and be safe. Camp Half-Blood is incredibly safe. Yes, they have the children trained to be child soldiers and do war against each other, but it's incredibly safe. They walk around and basically it's like a mean girl's cafeteria scene being like, those, those are the daughters of Aphrodite. Those are the sons of, of Ares. What they should do <laughs> is make it so that Percy doesn't really know a lot about Greek mythology so that when it's being explained to him, you can explain it to the audience. But really what it is, is every single person seems to have a, an encyclopedic knowledge of Greek mythology, and they're telling the information to each other, which they would already know. Like Percy would go to Grover and be like, oh, Aphrodite, the goddess of love and sex? And Grover's like, yes, Aphrodite, the, the goddess of love and sex. Like they all have the same amount of information, but have to explain it to the audience. So it's just people talking about things they already know to each other and everyone knows everything and they're just kind of speaking it out loud. 10 out of 10, no notes. While he's at Camp Half-Blood, he discovers that his dyslexia is because his brain is hardwired to read ancient Greek and his ADHD is his innate battle senses. Now these are the parts that I was talking about before where you realize that this book is incredibly creative and like it's fun. Like that is a really good idea. And there's other moments where when we get to Medusa's lair, the imagination in this and the fun in this, it, it's it's like actually kind of cool. It's just so poorly executed in this movie. Writing a book for children, presumably who have ADHD or dyslexia and reframing those things in a way that basically suggests that they're demigods is sick. That's awesome, okay? That's awesome. He also runs into Mr. Brunner his teacher, who was in a wheelchair, and he's a centaur. He also, while he's there, looks and sees Annabeth. Annabeth is the daughter of Athena, goddess of war and strategy, and she's absolutely slaying it with her sword, doing a sword fight. She has brown hair and blue eyes, and oh boy, if you were online when this movie came out, the wreckage left in the wake of Annabeth not having gray eyes and blonde curly hair. Unimaginable. The book fans were mad that she had brown hair. And I do understand in a sense that like, just get her in a wig, dye her hair. It's not that hard, but it was bad online. You know what I mean? Like we were in the trenches as a society when it was revealed that Annabeth was going to have brown hair in the Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief movie. Okay. Also at Camp Half-Blood, it's just kind of revealed that another facet of Grover's character, besides the fact that he's a loyal friend and the protector of Percy, his whole job is to be Percy's protector. So not only is your mom presumably dead and you find out that you're a demigod and your absent father is Poseidon, you also find out that your best friend is basically paid to be your best friend. So there's a lot going on in Percy's mind right now. And I wish we explained it in any way. All we really get is at one point, Percy looks out onto the water looking kind of sad. And that's the extent of the processing of this trauma and change. But besides being his protector, Grover has little quips. He's a funny guy. 
and he's horny. The daughters of Aphrodite are like, hey, Grover. And he's like, hey, baby. And that's his whole thing. That's it. That's all. Now it's time for a game of capture the flag. We meet Luke, who is the son of Hermes, who is Hermes. Hermes. We'll go with Hermes. He's the messenger of the gods. And there's basically the blue team and the red team. And it's capture the flag with swords. And you get to cut each other up with your swords and shit. It seems incredibly dangerous. All you need to know about Luke is Luke is, you know, if you're, you know, when you say you want Austin Butler and your mom says we have Austin Butler at home. Is wish.com Austin Butler. And his character is incredibly inconsistent. In this scene, he's kind of like a himbo, golden retriever, nice guy who wants to protect Percy. And in a later scene, he's just a completely different character. And it's not like he's lying. It's like he is a completely different character. So they're playing capture the flag. And Luke is like, you know what? We'll take Percy on our team. Let's get him a helmet. Let's go. And they're running. They're doing sword fighting. Percy is immediately amazing at sword fighting. So those stakes are removed. He's been at ca Camp Half-Blood for four days, three of which he was unconscious because his brain was bleeding. And now he's just amazing at sword fighting. Great. He runs away from this fight. Luke is sword fighting, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? Who cares? Boring. And he finds the other team's flag. When he goes to get it, Annabeth is there and she's like, I'm not going to let you take this. Also, our parents are enemies. Did you know that? They don't get along. She sword fights him. Another notable thing is that the armor for the boys is regular armor. And the armor for the girls is a little tank top with boobies. Free me from this pain. So she cuts him up a bunch, lightly kind of paper cuts him with the tip of her blade. He lies down on the ground and the other teams are surrounding just watching this sword fight. And I get that the sword fight is interesting, but again, it's capture the flag while the other team is distracted by Annabeth lightly cutting Percy with a blade run and get the flag. Like, it's like they wanted to play like a war game, but they made it capture the flag. Somebody just go get the fucking flag. Run and get the flag. While Percy's on the ground, he hears his father's voice in his head go, go to the water, Percy. It will give you power. And he puts his hand in the water and it runs up and it heals him instantaneously. And then he beats Annabeth in a fight. And this is what I mean by the stakes have never been lower. This is Percy's second time sword fighting and he's amazing at it. He dethrones Annabeth who is the daughter of the goddess of war. What? Afterwards, they have a celebratory kind of bonfire where they roast a pig on a, st on a, s a stick, a spit. Every single character besides the main characters, their only identifying quality is who their parents are. Like they don't talk about their hobbies or anything. They're just like, I'm a son of Aries. It's like, do you knit? When's your, when's your birthday? What's your favorite color? It's like, I'm just like, I'm daughter of James. And that's all you need to know. That's all they talk about. At the bonfire, Annabeth and Percy kind of start to bond. It's worth noting, they I think they CGI Annabeth's eyes or they give her crazy contacts because she, her eyes are like this and they're too blue. Like, it's crazy how blue. It's like, it's too, it's wild. It's Nobody's eyes have been wider. During the bonfire, the actual bonfire turns into Hades. <laughs> Don't you hate when that happens? FML awkward and Hades is like Percy Jackson show yourself <laughs> fireballs everywhere give me the lightning bolt and I'll give back your mother the Minotaur actually kidnapped your mom she's not dead so that dramatic tension immediately removed from the storyline <laughs> you can come and get your mother if you bring me the lightning bolt and Percy's like well I don't have the lightning bolt but why don't I just go and show him I don't have the lightning bolt and then he'll free my mom so that's his phenomenal, amazing plan. So Percy packs up that night and leaves in the in the dark of night. Grover follows him and is like, well, I'm going to come with you. I'm your protector, obviously. Annabeth is also there. And for some reason, despite talking to Percy twice, the first time she lightly cut him with the dagger. And the second time she just stared at him with the bluest eyes known to man. She's packed her bag and she's like, I know you're leaving. I'm going to leave too. You need my battle expertise. I never knew my mom, Athena. And I've never left the camp. I've been raised here my whole life. We never explore that. She's been ra her whole life and she's ready for an adventure. So that's kind of her arc. So they go to Luke because they're like, Luke will know how to get to the underworld because his dad is Hermes, messenger of the gods, and would go to the underworld to get messages. So we'll talk to him. They go to Luke's cabin where he's playing COD in a gamer chair with approximately three different screens of, of, of the video game. And he's a different character now where before he's like, all right, Percy, let's play. I got you, man. I'm just kidding. Now he's like, what's up, bitches? Come to old Luke's place to get some modern technology, I see. Because he's like a modern tech dealer also. Sure. They tell him what he's doing and he says that 
Persephone has visitors and that's the easiest way to get out of the underworld because getting into the underworld is easy but getting out of it's the problem. So you have to get Persephone's pearls and they're hidden all across America and if you stomp on the pearl and crush it and think about where you want to go it'll bring you back. So that's what they need to do. They need to go on this quest to get all these different pearls. He also gives Percy his dad's flying shoes just to help him out because his dad has flying shoes but they're converse with wings quirky who says i can't wear my converse with my dress now baby he's so rock he's just ro he's just quirky he's a quirky he's not like other girls and he also gives them his shield to help them protect and fight off the beasts presumably that are guarding these pearls also if you recall the reason percy's literally at camp half blood is because it's the only safe place for him right now because everyone wants to murder him so they leave and they have this marauder's map that Luke's given them that shows them the location of the different pearls and the first one is in New Jersey and it's at a garden center amazing it's worth noting again Luke talks about how he's never met his dad and the reason he's helping them is because he wants them to kick his dad's ass he hates his dad and I'm like let's explore this trauma none of you have met at least one of your parents that's insane like let's explore that Annabeth was raised here. No, we don't have time. We have to go to the garden center, which is owned by Medusa, which is Uma Thurman having the time of her life wearing big f***ing sunglasses being like, <laughs> I've been waiting for you. This is, again, one of the things I say, like, this is awesome. I wish it was done better, but this idea is so sick where basically it's a garden center and they're looking for wherever the f*** the pearl is in this garden center they split up and there's all of these different statues that look like garden statues but they're people that medusa has turned to stone it's awesome medusa corners and annabeth and they have to she has to close her eyes because if you look at medusa in her uh, in your her eyes you turn to stone spoiler alert for mythology and medusa really hates annabeth because annabeth's mom is the one that cursed her to be Medusa. Fair. Grover figures out that Medusa owns this garden center because he finds a statue of his dead uncle. And again, we never explore it. He's like, oh, it looks like my uncle who was killed by Medusa. That's, I'm no word of a lie. That's how that scene goes. And we don't explore that at all. They run, they find Annabeth who's closing her eyes as to not look at Medusa in the eye. And Percy realizes that if he looks through the reflection of the back of his iPod touch, he can battle Medusa. So that's what they're doing. They're battling Medusa and eventually they kill her because Annabeth drives with her eyes closed through the side of the garden center and decapitates Medusa. So for the rest of the movie, they're carrying around Uma Thurman's decapitated Medusa head to use at any moment if they need to stun something and turn it to stone. There is something interesting to be said about like just the normalization of violence on women's bodies. Like it's like funny that they're carrying around a head of a woman who is cursed, but whatever. Nevertheless, I digress. They get the pearl. Next, they need to go to motherfucking Nashville, baby. And in Nashville, there's a replica of the Pantheon. And in the Pantheon at the top, there's another pearl. So they stay till the place closes in the washroom and then leave. We're like, we're gonna go get the pearl, talking at full volume voices. And they see all these janitors and they're like, oh, how are we gonna get these janitors gone? Annabeth brings out her fing bow and arrow with poison darts that stun the janitors. They think that she's gonna kill them, and there is a funny, a genuinely a funny joke that did really make me laugh where Grover goes, You're gonna kill them? Those are working class Americans. Funny. That's a funny joke. She stuns them all. Percy puts on Hermes's flying converse. Yeah! Hot punk, bitch. Call all time low. Percy's got his flying converse on. And he flies to the top, grabs the pearl and then the janitors are not stunned anymore and turn into a hydra a five-headed dragon they are like we've been waiting for you percy but there's five janitors <laughs> give us the bolt percy and then they turn into a dragon percy cuts their head off but then if you cut one of their heads off to regrow so my question here is he cuts one of the dragon's heads off so now instead of five janitors is there just a new sixth janitor is my question. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Grover then uses the Medusa head to stun the dragon. So now there's just a massive statue of a hydra in the middle of this tourist trap, but they get the second pearl and they beat it. It's also worth noting at this point that Harvey Keitel, who isn't Harvey Keitel, Percy's stepdad, is now talking to the news 
and being like, Percy and his mom are missing and Percy's really into drugs. So he kidnapped his mom. So Percy's also a fugitive just to he heighten the stakes that are non-existent. It still doesn't really feel like there's any stakes. And there's unexplained weather patterns all across the world because the gods are angry and they're gonna start a war. Now they go to Las Vegas, Nevada, baby, to get the third pearl. And they have to go to the Lotus Casino. And in the Lotus Casino, it's basically this like fun land with like music and and dancing and arcade games and gambling and all these fun things. And they go there and they eat a lotus flower and the lotus flower basically makes you high and you lose your concept of time, which is so me. <laughs> and they stay there for a f ton of time. And while this whole like montage is happening in the Lotus Casino where they're like dancing and Grover's talking to women because he's horny. That's kind of his whole thing. And they're gambling and all this stuff. Poker Face by Lady Gaga is playing and it's awesome. This is my favorite part of the whole movie. It's just they eat this little like Lotus cookie and they're like, mmm. And then you just hear like, ma 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 ma. It's just the beginning of Poker Face. No notes perfect scene. And again, this is like a genuinely creative and cool thing that Rick Ridorian has written where Percy realizes that t the concept of time is twisted in the Lotus Casino when he's talking to a guy and he's like, oh, do you like this movie? I'm from the 70s, by the way. Like he's basically saying like, this is the best movie of the year. And Percy's like, but this movie came out in the 70s. And he's like, yeah, it's 1971, baby. And everyone in the casino has been there since like different times. Like there's people in the casino since the 70s. Like they don't know that the time has passed because they've been there the whole time. It's so cool. So Percy realizes this, gets them to stop eating the lotus flowers, and on one of the gambling games, I don't really know what it is, it's the ball that goes into the holes? Black Jack, maybe? That's the pearl. They get the pearl, they leave, and they're like, wow, that's crazy. And then they look at a calendar and they realize they've been in there for four days. So if you're keeping track, one more day than Percy was out cold with a coma in an ancient Greek infirmary. So they realize that they need to get the lightning bolt to Zeus or tell them that Percy didn't steal a lightning bolt. Their deadline is tomorrow at midnight because they wasted three days in a casino. So that's actually really good heightening of stakes obsessed with it. They go to the underworld. They meet Persephone. There's this whole thing where they have to like give money to this fairy, like not like a fairy, like with wings, like a fairy driver. Like he drives a little boat. He's like a creepy old man with a hood and he drives them through the underworld. It's who cares. I, there's this, this movie's pacing is rancid. It's awful. There's per parts of this movie that I was like, I've never been more bored in my life. And then fun parts. And it's, I just feel like this movie could have been a lot better. I digress. They get to the underworld and they meet Persephone and she's like oh I got visitors okay she's not like that but it would be fun if that was the choice that Rosario Dawson who's playing Persephone made now I know Rosario Dawson almost exclusively from the Rent movie so whenever she's like I'm Persephone I just see her being like will you light my candle AZT break that's what I see from her that's I look at her I'm like that's Mimi Marquez She's 19. That's Mimi Marquez, but it's Persephone. And she calls off her hellhounds that try to attack them. She's like, come on in, guys. And she br brings them in and they meet Hades. Now, Hades, if you recall before, we met him as a giant, fiery, scary monster. But his human form is kind of a Matty Healy, Mick Jagger, Russell Brand. Sorry, I like a burp forced its way out of my mouth at the... At the <laughs> The sentence Russell Brand. A terrifying combination of like a British greasy rock guy. And he's like, hello. Well, he's like, he's sounds less insane than that. But they basically say to him, hey, we didn't steal the lightning bolt. I just wanted to show you that I didn't so you can free my mom. And he's like, mm, I don't want to free your mom. Bye. Uh, boring. Uh, hate it. And then when Percy runs towards the fire where his mom is kind of like kept captive or she's like in this, it's not fire, but it's like a spirit it's like an amorphous kind of gas whatever he drops luke's shield and it breaks and inside is the lightning bolt okay so then hades is like liar you had the lightning bolt the whole time mm, i think i'm gonna kill you all and also kill your mom because you're a liar and also i wanted the lightning bolt because i was exiled to the underworld because i fought with my brothers and i actually want a war of the gods really bad i'm bored anna beth is like oh my god luke set us up it's been luke the whole time no reveal there, no dramatic tension, the least shaking re reveal of all time. Like nothing has been less earth shattering than that reveal. I think that this could be an actually really cool reveal. It's just that they don't pace it correctly. So you're like, oh my God, the lightning bolt's there. And then Annabeth's like, it's Luke, he set us up. And you're like, I guess that answer is 
asking every question I have. Thank you. However, at the last moment, Persephone goes up to Hades and is like, give me the lightning bolt. Bad, big, bad, big, bad, horny, big, bad boy. Takes it, shoots him, and she's like, I'm a prisoner here. I hate my life. The only thing I look forward to is when I get to leave here, and if there's a war of the gods, I don't get to leave. So get the f*** out of here, okay? So they're like, great. We've got three pearls to leave. One for Grover, one for Annabeth, one for Percy's mom, and one for Percy. Oh, sh so they didn't get enough pearls because they didn't do math correctly. And that's the most ADHD thing Percy's ever done. And I respect him for it because this would be fucking me. I'd be like, fuck. <laughs> I didn't count myself. So Grover stays because he's Percy's protector. He's a loyal friend. And this is the end of his arc. We get him back. He doesn't die in the underworld. Don't worry. So they leave him with Persephone and she's like, we'll have fun. And you're like, are you going to assault him? They leave and they think that you have to crush the pearl, right? And be like, and then I got to imagine where I'm going next. And they imagine going to the gates of Olympus. Now, where's the gates of Olympus? You guess. Did you guess it was at the top of the Empire State Building? This is a really cool, like, I don't know, it's cool imagery. I like it. But in actuality, what a horrible idea it would be to have the gates of Olympus be at the top of the Empire State Building. Because how many times are confused tourists wandering into Olympus and they're like cats merch their big bag from the M&M store <laughs> so they go there and Luke's there and he's like I'm evil by the way remember that reveal that had absolutely no impact but actually could have impact if it was done correctly uh, I'm evil mm. so they have this whole thing where they're like Luke why'd you do it and his whole villain bond villain speech by the way every single villain in this entire movie gives truly a two minute monologue about why they're doing their exact thing and in the time it takes them to do that entire monologue about why they're evil the heroes defeat them so just a blanket kind of suggestion to any villain in this universe don't waste time talking about your entire life's fucking story and your your motivation behind being evil and you could win medusa literally gives like a crazy two minute long speech being like <sighs> I bet you're wondering why I'm evil. So Luke is like, I think that our parents have been too bad of gods and they've been gods for too long and our generation needs to take over. He makes good points. I think it would have been really interesting. I don't know if this is what it's like in the book because again, read the book over a decade ago. But all of these children are like surely traumatized by being abandoned by their parents. So if he was like, I did it for attention from my dad, full stop, wanted attention from my dad who doesn't give a fuck about me. That's a very believable motivation to me. Anyways, doesn't matter because Percy is jacked out on powers. He is by far the most powerful YA hero. He can make hurricanes and shit. So he destroys Luke immediately and they go into Olympus. All the gods are there, massive, by the way. They're like 50 feet tall and Percy and Annabeth are like, wait, wait, the clock strikes midnight. Percy, ADHD king as always, running five minutes behind. He's a man after my own heart, that would be me. I'd be like, sorry, mm. I'm like trying to return the lightning bolt and I'm late, but I also have like a cup of coffee that I got on my on the way in my hand. I was like, I knew I was gonna be late already. So it's like, uh. and he's like, wait, wait, wait. He gives Zeus the lightning bolt. He's like, I didn't steal it. Luke stole it. You guys abandoned all of us, by the way. So that's why we're all fucking pissed. They're like, great, no war. Athena, who abandoned her daughter at, as a baby and left her to be raised in a summer camp is like, oh, it's my daughter. And it's like, girl, jail. Anyways, there's no war of the gods. That problem is fixed. And then Poseidon's like, wait, can I talk to my son for one second, Zeus, please? And then, and then I'll leave. We'll wrap this all up, but let me talk to my son for one second. So he goes and talks to Percy, but Percy is like this big compared to him. Like if I'm Poseidon, this is how big Percy is. He becomes little and he's talking to Percy and he's like, hey, thanks for doing that. He's like, I didn't do it for you, dad. You abandoned me. And they have this conversation where Poseidon is basically like, no, what you don't understand is that actually I was too good of a dad to you. So Zeus got jealous that I was spending all my time with you because I was too good of a dad. So he made a law in the God's world that we can't see our kids anymore, which is insane. And if my God dad said that to me, I'd be like, that seems like a convenient theory that you've created, but okay. They reconcile a little bit. This is the end. And then basically the movie ends with Percy, Annabeth, and Grover, who they get back. Oh, they get Grover back from Hades because Percy's like, I returned the lightning bolt. Can you get Grover back from the underworld? And they're like, sure thing, bestie, don't worry about it. So that's wrapped up off screen. And the besties are all at Camp Half-Blood training. That's how the movie ends. Here's the thing. There were parts of this movie that I genuinely enjoyed. I think like the actual conventions that were written in the books were fun. Like the Lotus Casino was fun. Medusa's Lair is fun. A lot of the like Greek mythology things that we've made modern are fun. Like having Percy be dyslexia be 
be dyslexia, oh my god. Having Percy be dyslexic so he can read ancient Greece, things like that. Ancient Greek, I'm having a stroke. So he can read ancient Greek is cool. I enjoyed all those things. I loved the Lotus Casino scene. Any excuse to listen to Poker Face by Lady Gaga, I'll take. So I liked all those things. I liked when they were at Medusa's lair. I thought that was really cool. I liked that everyone was a little statue. I just, it was paced horribly and there was no tension whatsoever. Like again, JK Rowling, turf. I'll say it again. Every time I do, somebody's like, she's actually not a turf. She's actually protecting women. And f off, respectfully f off, who cares? But in a lot of those, even the Harry Potter movies, like there's tension when they're like, who is Sirius Black and why is he in the castle? And the prisoner of Azkaban. You want to solve the mystery? There's no mystery in this. It's just things happen and then a character explains what's happened. And I want more mystery. The pacing, insane. But watch the movie if you want. I don't know. Other than that, thank you so much for watching. The link to my podcast, my Instagram, all that stuff is in the description below. And I'll talk to you later. Bye.